uh, we'll get started with our uh, discussion on fundamentals of atomization. Uh, Professor Abhijit Kushari was supposed to be the the co-host with Marcus on this part of the session, but he had something come up, so I'm going to step into step into his shoes a little bit, try to see what we can do. Uh, we're going to start off with a presentation by Marcus about uh, primary atomization. And we're also going to hear uh, some thoughts from Guillermo about a, sort of a very different spray application, I think. But just to show that the fundamental issues are similar, after that we'll go into discussion more. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks again for inviting me here. I enjoyed it tremendously so far. Um, so I want to talk about, uh, since the session or the discussion is about the fundamentals of atomization, I want to talk about can we try to use simulations to understand the uh, fundamentals. And uh, first I should start off by acknowledging the students I've worked with on this topic is Peter Brady, Sina Goz, and Sandy Brana, and the support by NSF, Navy, Cascade Technology, Honeywell, and UTRC. We have collaborated on some of these topics. Okay, as we all know, the details of primary atomization are largely unknown, and that is in part because experimental access is difficult, if oftentimes not outright impossible, to probe the really the real near injector region of the atomizer. Um, even if we have optical access to the atomizer itself or the combustion um, device, the spray drops typically obscure the atomization process. So we have to kind of try to get past those uh, drops. And there have been some new experimental techniques that try to achieve this, among them ballistic imaging, where you use time gating of photons or fo phase contracts x-ray um, done uh, at Argonne National Lab. So there are some techniques that come online nowadays to try to probe the primary atomization region. Um, the trouble is a little bit, even though that's all great and good, um, some of these techniques, or most of these techniques, actually don't, cannot give you yet the full time sequence of data. They can uh, give you maybe enough spatial resolution to see a lot of structures, but then they're a single snapshot. And um, you can't really follow what is the actual primary atomization mechanism because for that you would need a sequence of the same instance, the same breakup process, uh, a long high-speed sequence of images. So there's still a lot of work to be done to uh, improve those experimental techniques. So in the meantime, the question arises, can we use simulations to study the physics, the fundamentals of the breakup process, or this primary atomization? And I already showed some of these images before, but now since we're not limited to uh, diesel-type engines anymore, I can throw in some other examples. So people have tried to do that in recent years. And again, the examples by Olivier Desjardins, uh, Menard and uh, Berlamont, and then here Fuster as well uh, for different configurations. And there's also Chinju and Umemura. Uh, Madhu Pai has done some work for Jet and Cross Flows. Bo et al. who are from uh, Glimpse Group, and probably many others that I apologize for not uh, quoting here. So we've done some work on this as well, and I've already shown you the jet here, so let me skip over the jet. We've done some single drop in turbulent cross flow atomizations where we put a drop into a turbulent flow to try to study does turbulence in the gas phase impact drop atomization itself. Here's a Weber number 50 drop with a turbulent Weber number of 0.6. And we find that it does impact above a certain turbulent Weber number 0.6. The, the threshold seems to be around 0.5, 0.5-ish. Below that, there's not a major impact on the atomization. Yes, turbulence will deform the jet, uh, will deform the drop, but will not cause additional breakup. Above about 0.5 at 0.6 here, it does visibly impact the atomization characteristics. So we can apply these techniques to formally a secondary breakup kind of scenario. But we also did uh, jet and cross flow work. So this is a turbulent liquid jet at a momentum flux ratio of 6.6 .6 and a cross flow Weber number of 330. And uh, we, the, the cross flow is coming from left to right. We have the injector sitting down here. So we take into account the internal geometry of the injector, which is a pipe, and then a taper section, and then a larger pipe. And uh, we run detailed LES or high resolution LES, almost DNS simulations of that internal geometry, store the velocity as a database for the actual two-phase flow simulations. 
And we do that taking the cross flow at the right momentum flux ratio into account. So we run these simulations and we can look at the different breakup processes and this jet kind of sits at the intermediate boundary between the two different regimes. So we have this type of break, back breakup mode that leaves behind these ligaments that then break up and form individual drops that then go downstream and spread in the channel. And you will also have um, at these conditions stripping that happens on the side of the column near the injector where individual ligaments are formed, elongated, pinch off and form individual drops. And once this fancy fly through is done, it'll show you the individual breakup mechanism on the side ligament jet. Um, incidentally, the point of doing these ray tracing type simulations what not, what was not initially to do some fancy simulations. The point was really to try to get at a picture that an experimentalist would see to then let the experimentalist do his analysis of this picture and compare what he gets as data from the side view image, compare that to what the full flow data would be to try to look at what are there some uh, different, uh, what, what, what is the impact really of the uh, experimental diagnostic technique at that point. So you see these ligaments here that get stretched out on the side. And you see these ligaments form that then break up and form individual drops. Here's one that breaks up into these individual drops that go downstream. Okay, so that's uh, work we did together with Cascade Technologies and visualized at um, ASU. All right, so um, we can do these fancy simulations. The problem or the question then, of course, arises. Uh, they're all nice. They look good on first, uh, from a first view. Are they reality? Uh, do we actually describe the physics correctly? Can we trust these? Can we use these simulations as, as an experiment in some sense to really understand the physics? or are we looking at numerical artifacts, okay? So can we use simulations? Well, what, what do we need? We need the governing equations that describe the flow. We need numerical techniques to solve the governing equations. And then we need computers to apply the numerical techniques and find the actual solutions. So let me step through these and talk a little bit about where we are, where, well, at least where I think we are, and what the challenges are, what we need to maybe focus on more when we try to use uh, simulations as a discovery tool, if you wish. And I'm just focusing on that aspect of it. So a lot of the requirements I'm going to talk about are maybe a little bit more too fundamentalist from some point of view. Maybe they're too strict if you just want to use simulations to uh, do small design parameter variations or do exploration of design parameter space. So I'm really focusing on using numerical simulations as in addition to or I don't want to say replacing experiments, but using it at the, at the same level of trust that we have in experiments using a simulation as a discovery tool. So what are the governing equations? So we have a, well, continuity at plus Navier-Stokes equations uh, for uh, flows with immiscible interfaces. So the immiscible interface basically does the following. It adds a surface tension term in here, some surface tension coefficients times the local curvature times the delta function that's located at the face interface times the normal vector to uh, the face interface. So those are the governing equations on them, plus an energy equation, plus mass fraction equations, and plus equations of state. That would be the set of governing equations um, that we mostly believe are true for these type of flows. Now we can look at this in the low Mach number limit, which already introduces a an assumption that the flow is in the low Mach number limit. Uh, then we boil down to uh, the divergence free constraint on the velocity. Then the uh, Navier Stokes equation, the momentum equation here is basically unchanged. Plus then a temperature equation and mass fraction equations. And if we go to the low Mach number incompressible limit, the density and pressure decouple, and basically the density becomes a function of the phase interface. Okay? So, question is. Are these equations correct for flows with atomization? They are, we have good confidence that they are fine for single phase flows, right, without the surface tension term, obviously. Then. But are they good for multi phase flows, so phase flows with immiscible interfaces? And we have typically trust in them as well if we talk about flows with immiscible interfaces when there's no topology change occurring. But now we're talking about atomization, so there's breakup happening. So are these really the governing equations? Are these enough? to do atomization. Um, well, as I said, they're valid for single phase flows in the continu continuum limit. Okay? 
multiphase flows. What about multiphase flows in the continuum limit? So if we look at the continuum limit, then the phase interface becomes a discontinuity in the material properties in that limit. Okay, so we have a discontinuity to deal with. Um, but is this continu continuum limit really appropriate for atomizing flows? And it is most of the time, I would claim, except near the moment of breakup. Because at breakup, the length scales that we're dealing with go to zero. Because we need a topology change event, so that neck that connects it has to go to zero. So at that point, formally, the continuum limit breaks down. So the equations would not be valid there, and we need something more, right? We either need a statistical treatment, we need van der Waals forces, we need something in addition to the standard Navier-Stokes equations that we're used to dealing with. Um, now, is that just an academic thinking, an academic exercise, or does this matter in practice, okay? Um, I think likely not that we violate the continuum, I mean, does this, but this, I mean, that we violate the continuum approximation. I think it might not matter if the breakup is dominated by an instability mechanism that is described well in the continuum limit. So if we have a shear acceleration or capillary driven instabilities that our Navier-Stokes equation capture well, then it might not matter that we're messing up the physics at the final stages, okay? But I would almost claim that we need to have a capillary instability for the final stages. We need to have some ligament breakup happening. If we don't have a capillary mechanism for the final stages of the breakup, then I think we're in some world of trouble. Because, well, are there these kind of scenarios where capillary instability mode is missing or not dominant? Yeah, and that's for planar sheet breakup. On a planar sheet breakup, you might have instability modes like Kevin Hammers, like shear driven, acceleration driven instabilities that will cause a deformation of the sheet. But the actual breakup is not caused by them. All they do is they thin the sheet out. They make it thinner and thinner. Now, in reality, of course, the sheet will rupture at some point. But why does it rupture? Well, it ruptures because we leave the continu continuum limit and we have to do some statistical treatment or some van der Waals forces that will rupture this cheap sheet, which we don't capture. So my thinking is that if our breakup, if our atomization device is dominated by sheet breakup modes, then we might be in trouble because we might not capture the relevant physics in the process. And of course, it matters from a first principle standpoint uh, because if we want to do this as a discovery tool, we have to really make sure that we capture all the physics that are required. Okay, uh, so that's about the governing equations. So I think we do a pretty good job, but in some things I feel very queasy. In some sheet breakup scenarios, I would not underwrite a simulation result. Okay, so then we have the equations. How do we solve the equations? Okay, so there exist many, 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 many different numerical methods. From finite volume method to finite difference to finite element to ghost fluid and variations and combinations of those. Um, you have ways of tracking or capturing the interface, level set methods, volume of fluid methods, pure interface tracking methods, and myriads of different combinations of these methods uh, together to form new methods. Um, so I don't want to discuss all of those in detail. So let me give you the purest view, what I think a numerical method should do. Um, and what are the guiding principles for designing a numerical method? So first off, Numerical errors must be distinguishable from modeling errors. That's the first guiding principle. Then modeling parameters should not be coupled to numerical parameters. And finally, models should not impose limitations on how small numerical errors can be. Now this is just a different framing of basically that we have certain models that limit how fine your mesh can be. And if I express it like this, well, okay, we all know that, but really it means that the model kind of limits my numerical, how good quality, how well the quality of my numerical result can be, because it limits my mesh. So those three things should be satisfied by any numerical method that we would want to use for a predictive type simulation, for a discovery tool. Um, and more often than not, and I'm as guilty as charged as well, we violate those principles. 
Um, and here's just some examples where we violate them. So um, dynamic Smagorinsky LES models, for example, use two filter levels. They use an implicit filter level, that's your grid resolution, and they use an explicit filter uh, to find the filtered level and then correlate the two, um, which couples the implicit filter, your mesh spacing, to the, uh, to the mesh, right? So your modeling parameters are coupled to your numerical parameters, to your mesh sizing. And that would be unacceptable, and there are actually ways around it uh, that you do two explicit filter levels, right? So there are ways we know how to deal with this uh, at this point of view. Now, the typical cop-out answer for dynamic Smagorinsky LES models is, well, if I refine my mesh, um, I will approach the DNS limit, okay? That's all good and fine. Um, it does not really relate at that limit to your model anymore because you're continuously changing your model when you refine your mesh up to the DNS model, uh, the DNS mode, where in theory the model shouldn't be active anymore anyways. Okay, so that would be unacceptable, but there are ways to deal with this. Now for multi-phase flows, we have these Lagrangian point particle approximations, which put these limits on the mesh spacing we can do near the injector, and that's been pointed out several times, that the mesh spacing needs to be larger than the drop size which from a fundamental point of view is really unacceptable because it limits, my, um, it limits me on how, much, how small I can make my numerical errors. Uh, what else do I have? Well, interface capturing method, level sets, WOF, and all the variants of it, they um, have the claimed main advantage that topology change events occur automatically, which is a great thing to do. If we do atomization, there's thousands upon thousands, millions maybe of breakup events occurring, and I don't want to deal with them each individually in my code. I want to have it done automatically. And the benefit of level set methods, or any fixed grid method for that matter of point, is that they do this automatically. How do they do that? Well, it's a finite resolution issue. As soon as two interfaces approach within the same numerical grid cell, that thin connecting bridge can no longer be supported by the underlying mesh, and an automatic reconnection or topology change event occurs. So I already brought that term mesh, the local mesh spacing into play. That tells you that this topology breakup model is mesh dependent. It depends on the local mesh size, which is not really acceptable. First of all, we have to recognize that this is a topology change model, okay? And second of all, it's coupled to the local mesh spacing. So from a purist point of view, it's not really acceptable. And then the final one is the continuum surface force uh, model or the continuum surface force model for the surface tension force. Um, the surface tension force is in the continuum limit, is a discontinuous force at the interface. It's located with a delta function at the interface. So how do I deal with this? Well, typically I have some form of spreading out this delta function. There are different ways of doing it, uh, consistent ways of doing it. One popular one is the continuum surface force method. Uh, goes back to Brackwell, which links the delta function approximation to the gradient of an indicator function, a volume fraction or a color function. It's the gradient of that, and it's the gradient evaluated on your local mesh spacing, which makes that a function of your mesh spacing as well, which brings in numerical parameters into your modeling parameters. Okay, and uh, so those are just some examples, and let me um, point out that verification and model validation are in principle, impossible when any of these are violated. Because you're not, what do you want to do with validation? You want to test your model. You're not testing your model if you violate any of these principles because you bring in a numerical error into your validation. So you're validating really your model plus a numerical error. And you're not differentiating between modeling errors and model and simulation errors. So you can't give a good judgment about your model, really, because you always bring in numerical errors on top of it. Yet we do it all the time, right? That's the point. We still do this. Um, then how do we solve the equations, right? Let's say we have a method that's independent of our mesh, um, a model that's independent of our meshing parameters or numerical parameters. How do we solve the equations? So from a theory point of view, a numerical method must be consistent, stable, and convergent, okay? And for linear, well-posed problems, we have this nice relationship that if we can show consistency and stability, convergence follows. 
So it means that we act, our solution, numerical solution, actually is the solution, a solution, of the underlying PDEs we're trying to solve. But that's not been proven for our nonlinear Navier-Stokes equations. Not even for the nonlinear Navier-Stokes equations, but now we add surface tension terms in it. So it's not been formally proven. And um, for many numerical methods in use for atomizing flows, the formal proof of either consistency, stability, or convergence is completely missing. And we rely on that such a proof sometime in the future will be found, and that we're okay, but that's a belief and not necessarily, well, it might be true that it can be proven in the future, right? That's what we bet on. So examples. So finite difference methods, for example, have an unavoidable intermittent zeroth order L infinity error for the material properties. So what do I mean by that? Think about you have a mesh, you have an interface in the continuum limit that is a discontinuity. If that interface is an epsilon to the right of a mesh point, you will see the material properties of one fluid. If it is just epsilon away on the other side of the mesh point, those material properties change by order one. They jump from the liquid to the gas side. And that's a zeroth order error in the material properties. It happens intermittently, right? It happens only when, the, when the, uh, the interface is close to the mesh point. It doesn't happen all the time, but it is there. So the question is, um, what happens to the zeroth order error? Does it pollute my entire solution, right? Now, it's common practice to blend out these errors at discontinuities for convergence analysis, right? That's what you do if you do shock, shock capturing method and things like that. But is that valid for atomizing flows as well, where everything depends on the dynamics of that discontinuity? Right? That's what we're looking at. We're looking at atomization, the breakup of these phase interfaces. It all depends on the dynamics of the discontinuity. So are these blending out of these discontinuities for formal proofs, is that okay? Or does it, do we need something better there? Okay. Um, all right, so now let's say we have a numerical method um, that somehow we think is consistent, stable, and convergent. Then we have to solve it, okay? We have to code it up in a program and we have to solve that equation. Which then brings us to two important points, code verification and solution verification. So code verification, what do we do? Well, we, what is it? Well, we have to ensure that we didn't do any programming errors, okay? And that's a really tough thing on the face of it because programming errors happen all the time, okay? Um, but we have to make sure that our code is free of programming errors. How do we do that? Well, we typically have some exact solution. We run our simulation and we compare our results to the exact solution, okay? Uh, that's all good and fine except that the exact solutions that we have should exercise all terms in the governing equations. And the exact solutions that we have today for flows with immiscible interfaces do not do that. We have exact solutions where we deactivate certain terms, where we do not test those terms. And we might have exact solutions that test one term and another exact solution that tests the second term, but we won't have an exact solution that tests both simultaneously, okay? Um, at least that's my thinking. If somebody knows an exact solution, I'd be happy to know if there is. So there's an alternative that's called the method of manufactured solution. And the idea is basically instead of finding an exact solution to the governing equations, we just invent or make up an exact solution. And we add an appropriate, appropriate modification to the governing equations in terms of an analytically derived source term to the governing equation that will guarantee that our made up exact solution will actually be the exact solution with the modified equations. So we introduce a slight modification to the equations by adding a source term to it. And that turns out to be a pure mathematical exercise. So we can choose any solution. And it's actually most beneficial to choose solutions that are unphysical. We don't care whether they're physical or not. We care about the mathematics at this point of view. So we can do exponentials in the solution. We can do all kind of other things. Uh, to test our numerical code. But this has been very successfully applied in single phase flows. Oberkampf, Roach, and Roy, and et cetera, did this. And we've uh, dabbled in this as well, and we have some uh, very promising initial results for flows with immiscible interfaces as well, where we derived some manufactured solutions. And the, the key difficulty is in how do you try, treat this discontinuity? Because 
manufactured solutions depend on error analysis, which in the end depends on Taylor series analysis. And a Taylor series analysis becomes tricky if you have a discontinuity in there because the higher order terms don't go to zero as you would want to have that. So you have to be very careful with those. So we've uh, done some work in this, uh, starting out with a multi-phase scalar equation. And we've shown that this actually will work, but we have to extend it. It has to be extended to the full Navier-Stokes equations in the future. OK, so that's code verification. Let's say we've run through this, and we've found all order of accuracy errors in our code. That's all the manufactured solution can do, order of accuracy errors. So solution verification. So we have to ensure that numerical solution that we find is not do unduly influenced by numerical errors. So if we would refine our mesh, does our answer change? And that really requires a great time step refinement study. And well, first off, it requires the definition of an error, right? Now I don't have an analytical solution, so what's my error? Right? If I don't have an exact solution, how can I define an error? What's typically the only thing you can do is you find, define your errors with respect to the finest mesh resolution that you have. Okay? And then you have to demonstrate that the solution is in what's called the asymptotic convergence regime. And that means that you have to demonstrate that the observed order of accuracy is equal to the formal order of accuracy. And let me point out that having two mesh spacings give similar results is not sufficient. Right? It's not sufficient to have one mesh with a result. You run a separate, finer mesh, gives you the same answer. It's not sufficient. You have to show that when you refine the mesh, your observed order of accuracy is in line with your formal order of accuracy. Only then can you be sure that under further refinement will you actually converge to the PDE solution. OK, for single phase flows, we have this grid convergence index by Roach that will tell us whether we are in the asymptotic regime. But we need to expand this for, immiscible, for flows with immiscible interfaces. Um, and again, if, if modeling parameters and numerical parameters are mixed, solution verification is impossible. You cannot do it. OK. So then, the next thing. We have to perform solution verification for every single simulated case, OK? And it's typically done, and I'm, as I say, guilty as charged, that we typically use physical arguments to justify a certain use grid resolution. For example, I know my drops are larger than 5 microns in size, so if I resolve this with 3, 4 grid points, I'm fine, OK? That doesn't really fly. Um, that's not good enough. Um, and we should not use solution verification of similar cases to justify a use grid resolution. Typically done as well, right? You have established a thing, you know a grid resolution for this case, and you say, well, that's certainly going to be enough for the case here because the parameters are not as brutal as in this case. So I should be fine here. Okay, it's likely right, but you still have to check this with solution verification. Um, but of course, th these two things here, they, they provide you guidelines with where you start, right? What is the likely necessary grid resolution? And if you know that, you don't have to do grid refinement to prove that you're in the asymptotic regime. You can do grid coarsening instead. Coarsen the mesh, okay, and see whether you're still in the asymptotic regime. That's fine as well, as long as you demonstrate that you are. Okay, validation. Um, so you can only do validation if you've passed code verification. And you can only do validation using results that have been solution verified. OK? And it's very important if you do a validation thing, you cannot adjust any, any modeling parameters. If you do, to recover an experimental result, you're not doing validation, you're doing tuning, which is fine, right? But it's not validation. Um, and really, we should perform validation simulations always without the knowledge of the experimental results. We should only know the boundary conditions, the initial conditions, the material properties, and that it, that's it. We should do a blind validation test case. And I know nobody is really um, crazy enough to do that many times, and I'm the same way, right? Because I need some um, certainty that I'm not completely off, but that's really what should be done should be blind, OK? But we must have experimental data for comparison. And let me point out that comparison to analytical solution is not validation. 
that's strictly speaking verification because you are comparing to analytical solutions of the same governing equations that you are trying to solve. So all you're checking is self-consistency in those. You're not comparing to reality. Now, if your equations are valid from first principle, that would be okay because you believe your governing equations anyway. And if you've done code verification, solution verification, then actually you don't need validation at all. Because if you believe your governing equations and you've demonstrated that you've solved them correctly, there is no need for validation anymore. Because validation only checks at that point the validity of the underlying equations. I would check with validation, are my Navier-Stokes equations valid or not? And if you believe them to be valid from first principle, there's no need for validation. But again, that's not the case for us, right? because we have all of these assumptions that we have to introduce in the Navier-Stokes equations. And going back to the discussion of what would an experimentalist, what would I need from an experimentalist, here's my wish list, of course. The experimental data must be usable for validation. Meaning all boundary and initial conditions must be fully defined. The measurement technique and its associated errors must be fully defined as well. I would like to know how it is done so I can try to reproduce it with my uh, numerical data. And I must, the experimental must measure the data of the model outcomes. If it's for primary iteration, it should, if I want to validate primary iteration, it should measure the outcome of primary iteration. Okay, and unfortunately, as we all know, there's a severe lack of appropriate experimental data for validation, and more validation experiments are certainly required, which is a tough sell most of the time to experimentalists because you're trying to sell to an experimentalist an, an, an experiment that does not study any new unknown physical processes. Right? You study, you do an experiment for something where you actually know the outcome more or less. Right? But you have to do it at a fidelity that is usable for a modeling person, uh, which is typically with finite resources for experimentalists, not something they look forward to doing. They want to discover new things, which I fully understand. Okay. And um, all right, so here's the next point, and that's almost my end, my last slide. So we must perform solution verified validation simulations um, for ensembles of boundary and initial conditions and material properties. Because in the experiment, it's not going to be exactly this boundary condition. There's some variability in it, and we have to take that into account by doing ensemble averages or calculating ensembles of that. Okay. Um, and we need to compare the ensemble averages from the simulations to ensemble averages of the experimental observations. All right, so that's validation. So once we've got the governing equations, we've got code verification, we've got solution verification of all of our simulations and we've done validation, now comes the final goal thing. We want to do prediction or we want to use the simulation as a discovery tool. So it requires the code verified simulation tool. It requires solution verified simulations for which no appropriate experimental data is available. Strictly speaking, only then it's a prediction. Because if I have experimental data I can compare with, then it becomes validation at that point. Okay? And only if I've done all of these things, I can use it as a credible discovery tool. Okay? So are we there yet? No. Unfortunately not. Um, there's plenty of theoretical numerical modeling design work to be done and all the points that I've outlined. Um, we can do nowadays single simulations um, with well, no solution verification is still very common, but we can do limited solution verifications today. We can look at grid size dependencies of drops that we're producing, drop size distributions. How grid dependent or independent are they? So we can do that. Um, so the problem is, of course, code verification, solution verification of all simulations and ensemble averaging requires orders of magnitude more computational power than uh, we typically want to spend. And maybe that's even available today. So computer science aspects will become a very important part in the future to try to deal with this. And this one here just limits on one slide all the open issues I think that are there that we need to address to make simulation a, uh, a discovery tool. So now I hope I haven't completely disillusioned all of you that we can actually do simulations as a discovery tool. And I think we can still gain meaningful data from it, but we have to rely on validation and things like this. But if we want to take that next step in the future, those are the things I think we need to address and, and deal with uh, to make it a true discovery tool, independent or in conjunction with experiments. Thanks.